I'm Marty Stauffer, and this is my natural habitat. As humans, we have the intelligence and the means to be able to alter our habitat to suit our needs. We can each choose an individual style of interior decorating, which is both comfortable and aesthetically appealing. Most wild animals are not so fortunate. Their apartments are already built and furnished, right down to the throw pillows when they move in. Availability of certain habitat is necessary for the presence of each individual species. And just as we humans can alter our interior habitats, we can also alter the world to suit our needs. In the process, we become responsible for seeing that the needs of wildlife are met. Without our conscious commitment, there will be no room at the inn for them. Come along as we discover why Home is where there's habitat. North America is a land of contrast, a continent of diverse topography, temperature, and precipitation. Within each varied landscape, a community of plants and animals has evolved. Many strands of life have spun together to form an intricate web. Some creatures emerged out of the water. With lungs and feet, they crept cautiously onto solid ground. Others found steamy swamps and sandy coastal dunes to their liking. Eventually, the skies, too, became home. Even the most rugged country developed unique communities of interdependent life forms called ecosystems. Within each ecosystem, plants and animals were constantly struggling to adapt to each other and to their surroundings. Survival was the only measure of success. Complex behavioral patterns appeared among both the mighty and the diminutive. Beaver engineered their own habitats. Most mollusks simply carried their homes on their backs. Squirrels learned that holes made safe shelters and storehouses. Foxes either take over and remodel the abandoned burrows of other animals, or they dig their own, complete with two entrances to avoid being trapped without an escape route. Some species successfully modified their lifestyles in response to a relative newcomer on the block. In the last few centuries, we humans have had a profound effect on the natural world. Man 
Jordan's urbanized environment did not intimidate the remarkable red fox. This adaptable mammal has learned to survive in close proximity to humans. Other resourceful animals create entire habitats out of water and wood. While humans still huddled in caves, beavers busily constructed their complex systems of dams and lodges. During the 1800s, they were trapped to near extinction for their lustrous brown fur. Now protected by law, they've made a dramatic comeback. With webbed hind feet, a flat rudder of a tail, waterproof fur, and powerful incisors, beavers are perfectly adapted to life in and around their ponds. These largest members of the rodent family may grow to four feet and weigh up to 60 pounds. In the mountains of the Rockies, they make quick work of aspen, their favorite food and building material. During spring runoff, when high waters could burst their dams, beavers regulate stream flow by letting more water pass through their ponds. Though sometimes unpopular when their engineering efforts flood roads and fields, most people are beginning to realize how important these master builders are as water conservationists. They create homes, not only for themselves, but for a whole variety of species. Waterfowl use beaver ponds for breeding grounds and stopovers during migration. Muskrats are common in these prime wetland habitats. With nose flaps that close underwater, Moose feed on aquatic plants that flourish in the slow-moving water. Nearby icy summits provide a year-round home or only one large mammal. The sure-footed mountain goat, insulated in its dense white winter coat, forages windswept crags for lichens, grasses, and forbs. If deep snows threaten to bury its food supply, the goat will descend from the tundra to feed in the shelter of the trees. Even below timberline, winter is harsh, but it's one of the few refuges left for the bighorn sheep. Once, herds of these spectacular animals roamed the Great Plains. Now, mountainous foothills provide their habitat requirements. Northward, up the chain of the Rockies, Alaska is one of the few homes remaining for the grizzly bear. The big omnivore represents the top of a diverse food chain. When the grizzly flourishes, 
It signals the health of the entire habitat. While bears hibernate, many animals migrate from one environment to another, depending on the availability of food. Every fall, along the Chilkat River in Alaska, bald eagles by the thousands fly in to feed on an abundant source of protein. Chum salmon leave the ocean and battle upstream to spawn in the same area where they were hatched. Spent and dying, their lives have come full circle. For the eagles, it's a time of renewal, but not without first competing for a place at the banquet table. Like the eagles, the Athabascans of interior Alaska exploit the yearly salmon run, capturing silver salmon in traditional fishing wheels. These salmon have journeyed 150 miles upriver to reach their spawning grounds. Fishing is an important element of the Athabascans' subsistence lifestyle. Women prepare the salmon as they always have. They clean the fish and remove the backbone. The salmon are scored, slightly stretched, and hung up to dry for several days before being removed to a smokehouse. The dried fish sustains both the people and their dogs throughout the long winter. For 35 million years, the wide expanse of America's heartland was a sea of grass, from the arid high plains east of the Rockies to the moister tall grass prairies of the Midwest. On the grasslands, as in every habitat, animals owe their existence to plants, in this case, the hardy native grasses. In a land where only 10 to 20 inches of precipitation falls in an average year, grass roots grow to be several miles long. Undisturbed grasslands are remarkably rich in mammal and bird life, once abundant, greater prairie chickens cling to existence on patches of mid-grass and tall grass prairie. Adaptive plumage renders them nearly invisible. Hands that are incubating eggs sit almost motionless for three weeks in spite of violent afternoon thunderstorms.
prairie storms, though blustery, are normally brief. And with her dense, weatherproof plumage, the hen has little to fear from an afternoon shower. Even extensive hunting and egg gathering by Native Americans had little effect on grouse populations. Modern civilization, however, severely threatens the survival of the prairie chicken. Before the Civil War, settlers had little impact on grassland ecosystems. But the end of the war triggered an exodus. Huge tracts of land were claimed for grazing. Even more devastating was the impact of farming. Virgin prairie was plundered, plowed under to plant wheat. War was waged on the sea of grass. With the advent of steam and then gas-powered tractors, millions of acres were ravaged. Grasses adapted to hold down the light soil of the plains were replaced by the fragile root systems of grain crops. In the 1930s, the inevitable happened. Three straight years of drought transformed our Midwest into an immense, nightmarish dust bowl. Dense clouds of dust, called black blizzards, raged across the bleak landscape. With no substantial root system to protect it, the topsoil blew away, and over 60% of the human inhabitants deserted the land many for cities further west. Today, there are still places where we can see what the high plains looked like hundreds of years ago, when bison by the millions populated the prairie. Bison trampled down the tall grass allowing for prairie dog colonization. The bison, in turn, then feed on the actively growing grasses kept short by the vegetarian prairie dogs. Low-cropped grasslands are essential for prairie dogs to spot predators and send up an alarm call. While prairie wildlife were adapting to their home on the arid grasslands, other animals, concealed in darkness, evolved in the caves of America. Bracken Cave in Texas is home to over 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats a gathering of more mammals in one spot than anywhere on Earth. 200 adults per square foot crowd onto cave ceilings. After females give birth to their pink pups, this immense maternity ward may swell to 500 bats per square foot. Their droppings called guano, accumulate on the cave floor, feeding a host of insects. Baby bats that fall from their roosts are doomed, but provide a source of food for the insects and other animals which live within the cave ecosystem. Even before sunset, the free-tailed bats leave the relative safety of the cave on their nightly hunt. Great clouds of bats can be seen for miles. Before they return, they will have eaten up to a half million pounds of insects.
Largely because of destruction of their cave habitat by humans, bat populations are at an all-time low, preventing bats from fully benefiting both man and nature. Bats decrease harmful insect pests, and fruit-eating bats are the only significant pollinators of large cacti, upon which the fragile desert ecosystem depends. In this land of perpetual drought, few mammals, like the desert bighorn, have survived. With enlarged ears, they can air cool their bodies. The oversized ears of the kit fox function the same way. The only successful large plants are some species of cacti. The desert tortoise has learned to dig burrows to escape the heat. These dens are handed down from generation to generation. Aggressive if they encounter each other, males battle for both females and territory. In the desert, however, the most frightening enemy is human development. Few places remain for the desert tortoise to live in safety. Dramatically different from the desert habitat are the mangrove swamps of South Florida. This habitat is typified by the red mangrove. Its roots radiate down and out anchoring the tree into brackish coastal margins. Sediments accumulate in the mat of roots. A shoal of land can develop, which may someday support a flourishing forest. Mangrove oases provide more wildlife homes than do windswept coasts. Crabs eat tiny plants and animals brought in twice daily on the tides. Great blue herons and cormorants hunt fish and crustaceans in the swirls of mangrove roots. Osprey snare fish from the brackish surface. The gentle manatee also calls these slow-moving bays and rivers home. It feeds on aquatic plants that grow in the warm, oxygen-rich water. Humans have not treated the manatee kindly. Boats race through these Florida coastal habitats, slashing the slow-moving mammals with their whirling propellers. In our quest to conquer nature, we have left few species of plants and animals unscathed. We humans have destroyed more of the Earth's ecosystems in the second half of the 20th century than in the previous 10,000 years. Nearly every major American river has been dammed. 
virtually all of our old growth forests have been felled. Our marshes and swamps have been drained. We have desecrated this sacred land. Once hunted to near extinction, the whooping crane became the focus of concerned conservationists who launched a nearly superhuman effort to save this majestic bird. But without preserving its habitat, whooping crane populations can never be sustainable, for none of Earth's creatures can exist without a place to call home. The responsibility for the preservation of life on Earth sits squarely on the shoulders of humans. We alone will choose whether or not to save a home for all living things. As we've seen, this great land of ours is divided into much more than just indoors and outdoors. The wild world is composed of many different life zones. Each of these contains many ecosystems and each ecosystem supports certain wild creatures. I believe we can all work together to preserve this precious diversity. And we must, for the sake of our beloved wildlife. For only we humans can comprehend that home is where there's habitat. I'm Marty Stauffer. I really am. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.